Okay, let's see. Uh, it is 12.50 in the morning, and I am recording this because my sleep schedule is just completely fucked. And I used to think that I just lack self-control, but I think it might actually be related to my illness. But I did invest in a microphone, so hopefully I sound better than I did before. I am totally in my pajamas, too, because I <laughs> do not give a shit. I think people usually make themselves look really pretty before they talk on camera, but I'm chronically ill. I don't have a lot of energy, so yeah. And I do like to wear cute pajamas because I spend most of my time in bed nowadays, so you know, might as well look nice while I'm laying around all day. So I thought I would talk a little bit about how I got into the animation industry and my life leading up to that. And at first I was kind of like, mm, if I'm just telling this personal story about my life, would anyone even care? But then I remember there's like this entire genre on YouTube of people just telling stories from their lives. And I've had a lot of crazy stuff happen in my life, so I figured might as well talk about it because... I mean, it's something to do. I've been very, very bored lately, so yeah, and because of COVID and the pandemic and being chronically ill and also recent stuff, I spend most of my time alone, so maybe this is just how I'm coping with the fact that I am just going insane from lack of human interaction. I'm just going to pretend that I have a friend here and I'm talking to them because I, I am lonely. So... I feel like there are two different ways that I can tell this story. I can tell you the easy, professional, short version that I think most people are looking for because when most people hear, how did I get into the animation industry? They want advice that they feel like is going to help them on their own journeys. So there's that side of it. And then I can talk about the other side where I will ramble about parts of my life and just like how I had these goals and how I pursued them through my life and where it ultimately led me. And that version of the story is going to be a lot more personal and most of it's going to have very little to do with the animation industry itself. So yeah, I, I feel like it might just be an excuse for me to trauma dump or something, but like... See, the difference is that I'm not dumping it on a person. You are consenting to watch this video, so... Anyways, if you're watching this video because you just are a wannabe animation industry person and you just want to know, like, how do I get a job in animation? This is... this is not the video for you, okay? Like, this is not an advice video, so you probably will just want to, like, click out now. But just for the sake of satiating people who want to hear that the short version is that I reached out to people and studios and applied and asked for tests. One time I eventually got a test and it led to me getting freelance, which led to me getting hired full-time at Cartoon Network. So that's the short version. That's the version that most people would want. So now that I've told you that, you can be satisfied and be on your way. But if not, you can hear the full long story. So I think for most people, they have this point in their life where they decide that they are going to pursue art and it's this revelation. I never had that because I always knew that I was going to pursue art and I was going to work in animation. I know that sounds really weird to say, but it's the truth. According to my mom, I started drawing when I was five months old and she has a picture that I've, she has the picture that I drew to even prove it. She said that apparently I was crying and she gave me a pen to chew on, which was probably not a good idea. And instead of chewing on it, I just began drawing with it. And looking back through my early life, I can never remember a time where I wasn't drawing. I, my very first memories are 
me always having been an artist. When I was four or five, I loved animated films and I knew that I wanted to work on them and I knew that I wanted to do story. I used to ask my mom to help me make, you know, bouncing ball flipbook animations and I would write, you know, my own movies and then illustrate them. So somehow I just always knew that art was a career that I could pursue and I always knew that I was going to go into animation, I was going to go into story. Which is very odd, but it's just a thing that was always there in my life. Despite wanting to be an artist, I had very, very severe self-esteem issues. And I mean like, going back to even when I was a small child, I was diagnosed as like a perfectionist. Because I would be five years old and I would be drawing and I would notice that my drawings were not as good as the drawings that I was trying to trace from. So I would get upset and I would crumple it up and I would throw it away and I would cry. And so I remember my mom apparently like bought me tracing paper so I could like trace movie covers and stuff just so I could feel like I was a competent artist at like five. But... This was the very beginning of me also having very, very severe self-esteem issues as an artist because I knew from a young age I wanted to be an artist. I revolved my entire identity growing up around being an artist. So if I felt like I wasn't good at art, I felt like I had no self-worth. My self-worth as an artist got so bad that when I was in elementary and middle school, I reached this point where I felt like, wow, I am not as good as adult professionals, so I will never be good enough to work in the animation industry. I am pursuing a hopeless dream, so I'm going to give up on it and I'm going to be an author instead. So there was a period where I would write a lot because I also loved story and honestly, the reason why I draw is for the sake of story too. It was never really about me wanting to make pretty pictures as much as it was about me wanting to tell stories and because the way I visualize everything in my head is very intense and specific, I felt like the best medium would be through art. But like I said, because I had these self-esteem issues, I didn't pursue art for a bit in the sense that like I wasn't serious about it because I felt like it was not a thing that... I could make a career out of, so I'm gonna be an author instead and do art as a hobby. Things really started to change when I got into high school. At some point in high school, I really solidified to myself that I wanted to be an artist, I wanted to pursue animation, and from that point on, that was my goal. I just drew to prepare myself to be a professional in the animation industry. So when I was in high school, I think like, 15 or 16, sophomore or junior year, somewhere around there is when I started to get very serious. And I remember researching schools for animation because that's when you start thinking about college and, you know, I found out about schools like CalArts and Sheridan and Ringling and SVA. And I had this list of colleges that I was like, okay, I'm going to make a bomb portfolio and I'm going to apply to all these colleges and this is my goal, this is my dream. I really, really wanted to go to CalArts too. CalArts was like my dream college, which is not weird or abnormal for people who want to pursue animation. like. CalArts had such a huge reputation, so of course, you know, everybody wants to go to CalArts and everyone's trying to get into CalArts. And so I remember getting involved in those communities where people would work on their portfolios and share their sketchbooks. And because of my self-esteem issues at the time, I remember I always really struggled with my own voice as an artist, not because I didn't have one, but because I felt like mine was not good enough. I often felt like my art lacked a strong identity. Like it was good, I guess, for my age, but I didn't really know who I was as an artist at the time. And I was also figuring all of that out. And I really, really wanted to go to CalArts. So I remember just prepping really, really hard to go to CalArts. I 
went out of my way to find figure drawing sessions at like local museums and stuff and I would drop into them and I would draw models to get the figure drawing in. I remember just going out and doing life drawing and just working very hard on my sketchbook and portfolio and for me this was just a very big deal. This was what I wanted to do. Cal Arts was the school I wanted to go to more than anything. I actually never went to Cal Arts. And a lot of that had to do with my self-esteem issues. But also I had this kind of shitty thing happen to me. So in high school my art teacher didn't like me very much actually. And when I was a senior in high school, I I think it was a senior. Was it a senior or a junior? No, it was, yeah, I was a senior in high school. So, okay, sorry. So I was a senior in high school and I had heard about it late, but I had heard about this program called CESA, which was California State Summer School of the Arts. And it's this summer program where you can learn animation and it's, it's at CalArts, but it's not hosted by CalArts itself. And, but a lot of people who go to CESA end up eventually going to CalArts. So for me, I was like, oh, this program looks great. I really want to go to this because it would just mean so much to me as an aspiring animator. So I remember I applied and I made a whole flipbook animation, which I can share that actually. And I sent in a portfolio. At the time though, I needed two recommendations. And the first recommendation I got was from a youth arts collective I went to in my hometown, which was really awesome and supportive. I'll talk about that maybe some other time. But then the other recommendation I ended up getting from my high school art teacher who didn't like me very much. So when she, she offered, it was weird because she offered to write me a recommendation but then she sealed it, so I never knew what she said initially, which I thought was weird because the other people who wrote me a recommendation let me read it and they praised me. And when I read her recommendation of me, it was like, not good. Like she had like said that I didn't really have leadership skills and all these other things. And I just remember I didn't have a choice at that point because I had to turn in my stuff for the deadline. And so I don't know if that was the reason I got rejected, but I would imagine it doesn't really look good to send in a recommendation, it doesn't really speak highly of you as a person. And so I got the rejection and that just completely gutted me. I was like, oh my God, because up until this point, I never actually had much luck as an artist. I put so much of my self-worth into trying to be a good artist, but I was never popular online. Like, you know, some teenagers would get like thousands of followers and that was just never me. I never really had much of a following as a young teen. And I usually, whenever I applied to like art contests, I never won from them. I was not the artist in school that everyone loved. And so when I got rejected from this program that to me, I was putting so much hope into and I know that like another high schooler in that art class got to go and I got rejected. So in that person, you know, I'm happy they got to go, but I just remember it was like, fuck. <laughs> so I was just, I remember I just became so depressed. I was like, didn't think that I'd be able to get into Cal Arts, And so I and did end up going to a portfolio day down in San Diego. And I did get my sketchbook reviewed by a couple of colleges. One of them was Laguna College of Art and Design. And then I did have someone at Cal Arts look at my sketchbook and he didn't say anything other than just turn it in. So it probably was a good sign, but after what my art teacher had done to me, and also just so you know, I also was in her APR class and I got an F in that class. So if you ever like want to feel like, oh, I can't make it as an artist, just know that I am the bitch who got an F in my fucking high school art class. And then I still got into the animation industry. So like, I hope that makes you feel a little better. But yeah, so 
I didn't apply to CalArts. I had my portfolio. I had all the figure drawings. I had my sketchbook and I just looked at it and I thought, I can't turn this in. I'm not good enough. I couldn't even get into CISO. What is the point in applying or even trying? And so I just missed the deadline. And so I Dem never got to go to Cal Arts, and that was, you know, a dream of mine for years, and it just never happened because of that whole situation, and I just didn't have the self-esteem to ever turn in a portfolio. And so, at the time, my family didn't really have much in terms of expectations for me. Nobody was expecting me to go to college. Nobody was even encouraging me or helping me. I was just kind of there and I was so depressed. And I remember thinking, well, I'm not applying to any of the colleges that I wanted to go to. I, I didn't apply to any of them because I felt like my work wasn't good enough. But then after missing all these major deadlines, I found out that Laguna College of Art and Design or LCAD had a later deadline than some of these other schools. And so I was like, well, I guess I'll just turn in something just for the sake of turning in something. So I applied to LCAD and I got accepted. <laughs> and it was funny because nobody in my family even knew that I applied. Like I just like showed up was like, oh yeah, here's the acceptance letter. And they were just like, what the fuck? <laughs> so yeah. And because I wanted to go to college out of high school, I ended up deciding that I would go to LCAD. So I ended up going to LCAD and there is a lot that I can say about my college experience, but for the sake of getting through this video, I'm going to kind of summarize and focus on the main things, which is going to be sort of things relevant to me wanting to pursue animation. So the first thing I will say is this is a completely different topic for another time if I ever wanted to talk about it and possibly piss people off. But there are a lot of issues with LCAD because they're very anti-digital animation and they struggled a lot with, you know, allowing students to kind of pursue animation the way they wanted to learn it. Like... LCAD compared to CalArts, CalArts students have creative freedom to focus on what they want while LCAD teaches a very specific thing which is traditional hand-drawn full animation and they will often nitpick how they want you to tell the stories that you do and they will also nitpick, you know, what characters you can animate and it was kind of ridiculous to me because I'm like, I'm paying so much money to be here, I want to get the education that I want out of this. So that was a thing. They do teach you traditional animation very well, but it's like, I felt like, you know, if we're going to do traditional animation, maybe learn the foundations and then allow people to broaden their reach. Because one thing I will say is when I left LCAD, I did not have any skills that prepared me for working in the animation industry because they just were so focused on like the old ways that they were not keeping up with what was industry relevant. And I just said I wasn't going to ramble about it, but I totally just did. But it was kind of an issue because I would sometimes get flack for my work when I was at LCAT. Like I was a decent animator and I can even share some of my animation work. And this was like me animating for the first time. So I think if I had continued to pursue animation, I could have been really good at it. But obviously animation was itself was not really my goal. I wanted to tell story. And so it's a little different. It's a different side of animation, but it's still, you know, an animation job. I remember being in class and like I wasn't allowed to animate some of my own characters because the animation chairman you know thought that they weren't gonna work for full animation and so that kind of sucked and then there was other stuff too where like I remember one time he called me out in front of the entire class and he like called my art style like a tumblr art style because he was just very anti like modern cartoon animation style and I was just like 
oh, okay, so it, like, kind of made me feel bad about myself, and then I ended up going to CTN, which, if you don't know what CTN is, it's kind of like this animation expo for people in the industry, and sometimes if you're an aspiring animator, you can go there and share your portfolio and stuff. So, and this was before CTN got big. It was when it was still, like, a small niche thing. So I did go to CTN at one point, and... When I showed industry professionals my work, they thought it was really good. And that was like such a contrast from how my style was put down at LCAD. So it was, it was interesting, I will say that. But I will say my short time at college was invaluable because, well, what happened was, you know, when you are a freshman animator, a lot of the seniors are working on their senior films and fully animating a whole film on your own with your other classes is very difficult. So the seniors are allowed to take on freshmen to have them volunteer to help in between or do cleanup or color on their films to help get them finished in time for graduation. And I remember when we got to see all the senior films, I was really excited about it. I was like, wow, I would love to help out on something like this. I would love to just learn under people who are more experienced than me. And so... I had this coincidental situation happen where I was on the school bus and it was only me and one other person and it was this guy and he was sitting there with like this box of just this massive stack of papers because it was his animation work and we started talking and he was one of the seniors and it turned out that he was working on his film and it was actually one of my favorite films that I was shown and I was like wow this is awesome I would love to help you can I help you and so I started to hang out with him on like weekends and stuff and I would help in between on his film and he became a very good friend of mine for years to come I don't know if we're friends anymore because of what just happened and I'm too scared to ask but anyways so that was a thing and also when I was in betweening for him I met another friend who was also in betweening for him she was only there for a semester and then she left because she got hired on Rick and Morty so like that was really cool and so these two people became very important friends to me and I met them through that experience and they ended up helping me in a lot of ways going forward. So I had no ulterior motives, obviously, but I will say that like if you are a freshman in college in animation befriending seniors <laughs> and like older peers is definitely the way to go because they're going to graduate before you. They're going to like get into the industry before you and they're going to be valuable connections. So yeah, that's, you know, just something to consider. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to get into the very heavy stuff. So I said I was going to content warn for specific things, but honestly, I think just from this point forward, just expect the rest of this video to just have mentions of very heavy things like suicide ideation, rape, self-harm, etc, etc. So just prepare yourself. My experience at college was cut short after a year and a semester I dropped out and when people ask me why I dropped out I would always just say oh it was expensive and you don't need college to get into the animation industry which is true but that's actually not the reason I dropped out that was the conclusion I drew after I had my college experience ruined for me because I had something very horrible happen um, I was having a lot of difficulty at this time and I will just be straight up and say that like I was unstable and mentally unwell because I've just had a very rough life growing up and I've just never had guidance or help or that was adequate or proper or what I needed. So I ended up in abusive situations a lot and didn't really understand what was happening to me or how to navigate them. I didn't know how to behave around others. It was just, it was, this was all stuff that I had to learn on my own as a trauma survivor. And so when I was in college, I also had at the time undiagnosed DID or dissociative identity disorder. 
and I'm not going to talk about this in this video, but it did impact me in the sense that there were things happening to me that I couldn't account for. I was losing time. I was having these breakdowns and harming myself, but then I wouldn't remember doing it. And I also was living with, at the time, an abusive roommate who just kind of kept me under her and she would mistreat me a lot and it was really bad to the point where when our friendship ended, my other roommates reached out to me and they were all like, we were worried about you because this person was treating you so badly. So it was just like, and I would like have amnesia for it and stuff. And at the time my amnesia was so bad, I thought I had like a brain tumor or something cause I didn't know what dissociative amnesia was. I didn't know what DID was. So I was just like, what the fuck is going on? I'm kind of freaking out because apparently my roommates are saying that this bag of candy is mine and I left it there and bought it, but I have no memory of doing this. And also apparently I'm going by different names, but I don't remember like deciding that. So it was just, it was just really wild, just, just on top of everything else. But so I was having these struggles and I was preyed on by another student at the school. And just for the record, I was not his only victim. He actually had several other victims and I had actually gotten to speak to some of the other victims. So this was not isolated to me, but there was this guy at LCAD and he was older than me and I think he was a junior and he, well, he took an interest in me and started talking to me and I barely knew him and I remember he invited me over to his place to hang out and he, you know, said all these things like, yeah, I'm huge feminist. I care about like social issues, yada, yada. And he wanted to hang out with me and I went over to his place and he took advantage of me and he raped me. And at the time I did not understand that I had been raped because it was coercive rape. He kind of like backed me into the situation where I just felt like I had to do it and it was horrible because I wasn't even like turned on at all. I was just like waiting for it to end. It was really bad. And I remember this happened and then to make it worse, he had a girlfriend at the time, but he was like, oh, I'm breaking up with my girlfriend. I want to be with you. And to me, I felt like, well, if we date, that can justify what just happened to me. But then, of course, the next day he was like, actually, I want to stay with my girlfriend. And uh, then he would just start ignoring me and it fucked me up because I was like, what? I was just like, I felt guilty. I felt like, oh my God, if I say anything, I'm going to ruin this person's relationship and everyone's going to hate me. So it was just this really horrible thing that happened to me and and the abuse just went on like whenever he wanted something sexual he would contact me and then he would use me there was a point where he did things to me when I was in my sleep so I couldn't consent to it and then he bragged about it he would assault me and then be like oh well I was just high so I don't remember doing it and there was even a second instance where he raped me again and he didn't use protection and I had this huge pregnancy scare and that fucked me up really, really bad. So I just, he, I just became very, very, very ill. And I remember the first time he did this to me, I just broke down sobbing the next day and one of his other victims just like, held my hand and was just like, I'm so sorry this happened to you because it was weird though. Cause at the time I didn't call what had happened to me, abuse or rape. I had just, I had thought it was my fault. And I had thought that I, I didn't know or understand what was happening because I just 
I had nothing to go off of. I didn't know about coercive rape. I didn't know about sexual abuse in like this way. So it just isolated me and I just completely fell apart and it destroyed me. It destroyed me so bad that I could not attend to finish my classes. Meanwhile, I had this roommate that was not being nice to me back at where I lived. And I remember I failed my classes that semester because of the trauma and a situation that wasn't even my fault. And I was taking out all this loan money and my family was not financially well off. And so for me to fail these classes, it was like, I can't afford to retake these classes that I failed for an issue that wasn't my fault. And so I became so sick and so depressed, I dropped out. This was the first time I had my adult life ruined. I've actually had my adult life ruined four times and my life as a whole ruined five times. The, this was the first time that something devastating had happened to me and that it um, just ruined my, my entire situation. So I dropped out of school and I went back home to my family. And for me, this just was a devastating loss. And I was so emotionally unwell at the time. I was so depressed. I didn't really understand what had happened to me, so I wouldn't really talk about it. And I didn't get much compassion or sympathy from anyone around me either. In fact, a lot of people were just very short with me or fed up with me because I was you know, too negative all the time and needed to focus more on the positive or I wasn't doing enough to take care of myself or like I, a lot of my friends would just get upset with me because they were tired of me being depressed. They were tired of me whining, but I had just been raped and had my entire life ruined. It was not a minor thing at all. And when I went back home, my family was not great. Like my mom is very unwell, very mentally unstable. So she also is just in and out of hospitals, screaming fits, like fighting with other people. She was like actively attempting suicide. And so I'd have to like try to figure out like, you know, if she had overdosed to a point that it was dangerous or not and whether or not to call the paramedics. It was just very hard and stressful on me to be back at home because my mom especially, she just would, you know, call the police on me if I tried to, like, go out and, like, do something or things like that. It was just really bad. And then meanwhile, I was also living with my childhood abuser who would just berate me and would tell me, you know, you're lazy, get out of here and go get a job. All you do is lay in your room and mope around all day. And it was just really awful. So I ended up in one bad situation back into another and so I had no way to really get better or do better and I wasn't a great person to be around either because I was just sick and unstable and depressed and suicidal. I was attempting suicide myself on a regular basis and so I'd like also overdose on pills and stuff and I'd end up at the ER a couple of times and thankfully it wasn't anything serious, obviously, otherwise they would have put me in a 5150, but anyways, and I remember at one point when I was in the hospital, I was just talking about what had happened to me and the nurse was like, well, do you want to report the rape? And that was the first time that it had really sunk in that I had been raped because I just did not understand my own experiences properly. And... So I, at the time, I felt so ashamed. I still blamed myself. I was like, I can't ruin this person's life. This is all my fault. I should have done more to stop it from happening was how I felt. So I just didn't know what to do. But at the time, I was also just sleeping excessively. I was so depressed. I felt like I was never going to work in the industry. I felt like I was never going to get to go back to school. I felt like my life was just 
ruined. And I did, you know, I would like... <laughs> I would like suicide post on my blog like every day, which I know that if I did that now, people would be like, wow, this young adult is so evil and manipulative because I've noticed that's like a big attitude that people have towards people having mental health struggles. But like, I was like a recent rape victim who just had my entire college life ruined and I had no help and no guidance and no support. So in like hindsight, there was really no way for me to like know better or get help or support and you know I guess just like consider that when you think about other people having those kinds of struggles and talking about them so yeah and finally though my grandparents got me a therapist and you would think oh okay a therapist it means my life is going to get better now because I am getting professional help but I actually, this was a really bad therapist. I don't know if she was just bad for me or what, but she just would berate me and be like, you know, stop talking about your trauma. You know, you need to get over it. Nobody cares. Focus on the now. And then she would call me a spoiled brat. Like she would say things to me like, oh, I, I think she might've been like a conservative Republican or something because there was this one point where I was like saying, it sucks that I can't support myself on a minimum wage paying job. And she was like, you're just not trying hard enough and you just need to get another job. And when I would tell her that I had uncontrolled, uncontrollable fatigue issues that prevented me from functioning, she would be like, this is your own fault because you're just choosing to sleep and stuff when I would literally fall asleep uncontrollably. I've talked about my sleep issues in another video. And she just would also do things like, oh, if you self-harm, the punishment is that we have to do extra sessions and I'm paying $100 per session and I cannot afford extra sessions. So it just encouraged me to lie about how poorly I was doing and I would pretend to just be doing well just so that way she would not force me into situations I couldn't handle and... There was like this whole motto of hers where she was like, you know, if you are feeling suicidal when you leave therapy, that's normal. It means we're doing the hard work. So if you stop going, it's because people are like cowardly or don't want to put in the work or get better. And so they stop seeing me when things get difficult. And I remember because of that, I felt like I had to stay and I would just leave therapy hurting myself and feeling more suicidal. And so... It was just a really bad situation. I actually can't believe that this was therapy because the therapy I have now is like night and day different. So I just want to say I do wholeheartedly believe that no therapy is better than bad therapy. So if you ever have a therapist who makes you feel worse about yourself or makes you feel like you can't cope with like your daily life or get tools to make it better, you do not have a good therapist. Even if you have a therapist that's like nice to you, but they aren't really helping you, I would say that they're probably not the best person to keep seeing. So yeah, I just, I just had that absolutely horrible therapy experience. So it's like, I was getting help and I was just getting worse. So it was really, really bad. Despite all of this, I just wanted to still work in the industry so bad. So I didn't really entirely give up. I had heard about the Nick Artist Program, and the Nick Artist Program is this thing where you can apply to either the story or the general art track, and if you get accepted, you get to be at the studio and be trained under them, and it just sounded like this really awesome thing. So I remember through all of this, I worked on a board portfolio to turn in, and it was very difficult for me because I was dealing with this depression, with these health issues. I struggled through it but I remember I just pushed myself so hard to get something together and I turned it in and I was proud of myself because I remember I like pulled an all-nighter got it turned in went to sleep and I I didn't even get into the first round I just was rejected immediately and that was it and so that like also made me feel awful and there was like this other instance where somebody at Nickelodeon, I think it might have been a recruiter, or someone reached out to me because I had drawn fan art for one of their shows and they were interested in seeing if maybe I could like test for 
a position, but then it ended up being that they were doing pre-production outside the country, so that didn't go anywhere, but I, I did have that situation, and it did give me a little more hope. I was like, maybe I can still get into the industry despite everything. So I decided I cannot take anymore if I live with my family for like another week. I am probably going to kill myself. I cannot stand this. I cannot stand this therapist. I am going to try this one more time because it is either I get better and figure something out or I just continue to rot in this situation. So I ended up moving away from home and I moved back to Southern California, but not where the industry was located. I moved back actually to Orange County because I had some friends I had made during my time at LCAD. And these are not the good friends I was talking about this. No, 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 no. These are, this is a different friend. And they were like, hey, our roommate sucks. We're going to kick her out. Do you want to be our new roommate? And so I ended up moving in with these people and I was like, okay, I'm going to get my life started again. And, uh, oh boy, oh boy. Okay. So I moved in with these new roommates and, uh, I'm just gonna say they were not very good people like I was initially led to believe and there is so much that happened that I it would take me hours just to go over it so I'm not gonna get into it in detail in this video but they were just not great they were a couple so like they were together and they had one room, I had the other room and they were just, one of them especially was just this really manipulative, really abusive person. And so she would just do things to me like she would try to control me, she would talk down to me. It was like she would pick fights with me over stuff and then just berate me until I was in tears over like stuff that just didn't make any sense. Like if I had talked about being like frustrated that I was having health issues and couldn't get help she would berate me and tell me how I should just consider myself lucky that I have insurance because she didn't when she just needed to apply for it because it was the same insurance that we would have both had it was like the free insurance there was this other time where I voiced an opinion on a movie we saw and she decided that I was wrong so she just like chewed me out until I was in tears over it there was another point where one of her friends was treating me like crap, so I just, like, asked if that person could not come over because they were not being very nice to me. And this person was being mean to her other friends, and she would shit-talk this person. So, yeah, but then she, like, lashed out at me for it because I... And she was just mad at me for asking something reasonable. And then when I tried to confront her about it and was like, hey, I can tell you're upset about this, she left the apartment and refused to come home or pay rent until I apologized to her. So it was just like all of this stuff and this person was just treating me horribly. And then of course, because she was in a relationship with this other person, this other person would always side with her. So I'd get ganged up on. And so it was just like really, really bad. And I was living with this and then it got even worse. And I'll get to that part in a second. So before I get to that part, while I was living in this apartment, um, there was, well, first of all, when I moved there, I needed a job. So yeah, and there was like this whole thing where I tried to get a job at like in and out but the roommate I had, the one that was like abusive, was just like upset about how bad her job was so I showed her the job I was applying for and we both applied for the same job and she got the job and not me and then she turned around and began berating me for not doing enough to get a job because she was worried about me paying rent and I was like what the fuck you literally anyways so like anyways I did actually get a job though and it was kind of industry relevant so that was really cool it was not an industry job though what happened was my really cool friend knew someone who used to do caricature art 
And so he was able to recommend me and they were hiring at the time. So shortly after I moved, I got a job as a caricature artist. And that was a really awesome and invaluable experience because I got to learn how to draw quickly and efficiently and I was really excited about it because, you know, when you work as a caricature artist, you are working with people and you sit them down and you draw and it's like putting on a show, but you also like, you know, can't make mistakes or have to learn how to cover them up. So I learned how to just draw with like broad, confident strokes and I learned how to be fast and finish drawings and work around mistakes. And these were all skills that were going to eventually, you know, help me in the industry and also getting my industry job. So that was like really awesome the job unfortunately didn't pay very well but it paid enough for me to get by so i was working as a caricature artist for a bit while i was also trying to apply to studios and work on a portfolio and get into the industry during the time that i was living at this apartment i did end up oh, sorry i feel bad the lighting in here is really bad i can't do anything about it because i don't have the resources to I don't even think closing this is gonna work hang on Ugh. oh well that's better I guess okay <laughs> anyways so when I also lived at this apartment I ended up going back to my old college and telling them about what happened to me and it wasn't just me I had also like talk to some of the other victims. I had printed out like, you know, their stories. I went in with a stack of like printed out chat logs of like this guy and like the things he said and did to me, like evidence of him, like literally sending me unsolicited dick pics and stuff. And then just being like, LOL, sorry, I was drunk. So like I went in there and I handed this to the school and I was like this is happening at your school I do not feel safe to return if I ever wanted to go back to school because this person is on your campus at your school and the school acknowledged that it was a problem but they definitely seemed more worried about their reputation than what was happening to me so their solution was just oh we'll just get him therapy and I'm like Oh, okay. So yeah, and then they like sent me to the school therapist who just tried to convince me to come back and I I was just like, I'm not going back to a school that has my fucking rapist on campus like hurting people. And so it really sucked and this school, LCAD like apparently handled a lot of stuff like this very badly because I had another friend who was being stalked by this one guy. He had like three restraining orders against him and the school also didn't do much about it. They just put him in therapy again. So I don't know what it is with them being reluctant to, you know, let dangerous people go. So yeah, it was just really bad. So I never got to get a degree and I never graduated. And uh, I guess my rapist did get to graduate and get a degree. So yeah, that was cool okay fuck what the fuck at another point i did come forward on my social media that had my school and real life friend connections and i you know said hey this person raped me this happened and some people were supportive but like a lot of people just didn't really care like i think he still has like 20 mutual friends with me on social media and even recently one of my friends was following him and I told them what he did to me and they still follow him. So for me, I was just brushed off very heavily for the most part. Like a couple of people were very supportive, but most people were just kind of neutral and just kind of didn't really acknowledge it. And so I remember that also really fucked me up because I was just like, okay, nobody cares. And so... Yeah, I mean, it just, it sucked. It sucked, yeah. And it was just a lot for me to have to process on my own. And so, yeah, I was like really, you know, I'm so dissociated. I, don't, I just remember I was definitely like not 
well over how that played out. So yeah, anyways, and then, and then as if things, okay, so at this point I was like, all right, I have a job as a caricature artist. I'm living on my own again. I am doing my best to rebuild my life and get an industry job. Maybe this time I can actually do this. In walks my abusive relationship. Okay, so I am going to say it this way. If you, this, okay, <laughs> this was my first narcissistic abusive relationship. Now, when I use the word narcissistic abuse, I'm not talking about people with NPD specifically. Unfortunately, I do not know what other term I can use because I know some people don't like using the word narcissist, I guess, because they feel it's ableist. I, unfortunately, this is not just abuse. It was a very specific cycle that fits this abuse cycle. So apologies. I don't know what other word to use to describe this type of relationship and its pattern without, you know what I mean? Like making it hard to find the resources. I, if I'm making sense. So yeah, but basically I was in a narcissistic abusive relationship with this person. I don't even think the person had NPD just by the way. So yeah. And anyways, and it was, it was absolutely horrible. So the thing you need to know about these kinds of relationships is they follow a very specific pattern. The pattern is that first they will groom you and they will idealize you. They will dump affection on you. They will dump gifts on you. They will tell you you're the best thing ever, that you're their soulmate, that they'll do anything for you and they'll do anything to bring you in. Once you start living with them, then they'll start devaluing you in small ways and it will escalate and escalate. Then once you hit this breaking point, they will then discard you or often by turning all of their abuse onto you and projecting it onto you. And then when you are completely destroyed and left picking up the shattered pieces of yourself because they destroyed your sense of self from the fucking inside out and you are a shell of the person you used to be, they don't stop there. Then they start the smear campaign and they always, always target your friends and people and they turn everyone against you and convince you, everyone that you're just this crazy person. They don't even feel bad. They don't feel guilty and they just walk off into the sunset and you are just left destroyed. And it is like, to it is a very specific cycle. And if you've ever been in these kinds of relationships, they always follow this exact same pattern. And it was genuinely like the most fucked up thing. And it just, it was so bad. So I was targeted by this person online who took an interest in me. And usually when people start grooming me, they often use my trauma to groom me. They will use my vulnerabilities. They will say, you know, I'm going to build you up and tell you how great you are and how you're the best person ever. And this person just like, just showered me in praise and affection and just, it was so intense. Like this person even broke up with their partner to be with me. And then they convinced me that they needed to move in with me after like only a month or two of knowing them because they said that their life was in danger and that their dad was going to kill them. So this person was also a pathological liar, just FYI. So I was like, oh my God, that's horrible. I don't want you to get hurt. You can come live with me. The person moved in with me and it just... They just abused me so bad. And it was like, like there was some physical abuse too where they would like restrain me or shove me and like they would just, you know, I mean, a lot of it's kind of blocked out, but basically it was just really bad and they would lash out at me over things all the time. And then if I got upset about it, they'd turn it around and would blame me and say that I was causing problems by being upset about this stuff. The biggest fight that we had was over this person's dog. So this person had a dog that had be, and it was like, it's not a small dog. It was like a medium sized dog and she had behavioral issues. 
and this dog was attacking everybody like this dog attacked one of my roommates and left a scar on their hand this dog attacked me and even injured me at points and it got to a point where like my roommates were upset about this I was upset about this I would ask my you know partner at the time can you please get this dog trained please you have to take her and get her trained or do something because she is aggressive we couldn't even walk her because she would try to attack other dogs like it was bad and they would just refuse. They would even say, you know, you telling me to do this makes me not want to do it. So it was just really bad. We were in the small apartment with this very aggressive dog and my roommates didn't want to confront my ex at the time. So they confronted me and told me that I had to give this them the ultimatum of like, you know, you have to get the dog trained or send her back to your family. And so I was just like, really stressed out that day too because I had also just been attacked by the dog again so when my partner came home I was like look I really need you to get her a trainer or you need to send her home because you're not just endangering us you're endangering your dog like if this dog bites somebody else and they report it like she's going to get put down without hesitation like this is you're endangering everybody here and they just went quiet and because and they were stonewalling me which is basically like where they just close shut up close down don't say or respond and just ignore you and by this point this person had done this to me every time I confronted them and whenever this happened there was always this pattern of when you do this I know that you're never going to respond or get back because it's probably like the 50th time we've had a conversation like this and because I had just been like attacked by this dog again and was being forced to mediate it with my roommates and everything I was stressed so I snapped at them and just chewed them out over it and was like you need to send this dog home or we're breaking up and that I sl I was upset so I slammed the door on my way out but this was like the first time I had ever gotten upset the first time I had ever yelled or raised my voice and my ex just took that and ran with it. And suddenly everyone, he, they were just like, we're breaking up now and would tell everyone and just dangerous. They were threatening me. They wanted to hurt me. And it, none of it was true. I was literally the one being hurt. I was the one this person would even physically abuse at times. And so, and my roommates, who had pushed me into confronting them suddenly took my ex's side and they all just bullied me. And it became this really horrific situation where I was being ganged up on because I had basically a breakdown over being attacked by an animal that the owner would not do anything about and was forcing me to stay in a small room with. And so it was just horrible and my ex just convinced everyone that I was scary and suddenly the story changed from I needed to move in with you because I'm in danger to I need to now go home to be safe with my loved ones because this person is dangerous. And so like, and at this point, I didn't really understand what was happening. I was so confused. I was like, wait, what is going on? Why is everyone ganging up on me? Why am I getting berated? I thought I was, you know, I thought I was doing the right thing. And so I did everything to try to be compliant with my ex. I was like, okay, I want to prove to you that I'm not this bad, scary person. So I'm going to leave the apartment for a whole week just so that until you get to go home. And so my ex would like post you know, oh, here's fun pictures of me hanging out with my roommates. And now my friend's coming to pick me up and we're going to go on our road trip home. It's going to be so fun while telling everybody that I was dangerous and scary and that they were leaving for their safety when I wasn't even in the apartment. I had asked my ex, you know, if you're going to stay at the apartment for like a week while I'm gone, could you please take out care of my birds? And they neglected and didn't take care of my birds either. And it just got even more fucked up because I was like, okay, the ex is, my ex is leaving now so I can go home and finish off the lease, right? No. So my roommates decided that I was now this dangerous, scary person and they bullied me out of the apartment. I could not come home because they were treating me like I was this menace, but I was on a lease. So I 
had to finish off a lease for three months at an apartment that I was not allowed to come home to. And this was just an absolute terrifying nightmare for me. And I remember begging my ex. I was like, look, I'm letting you go home. I'm letting you break up with me. I'm letting you leave. I am not getting in the way of this. All I'm asking of you is that my roommates, our roommates are very angry at me because they think that I've hurt you. Could you please just tell them to leave me alone so that I can go home? And my ex was just like, oh, don't make me pick sides. I'm not going to pick sides over this and would just refuse. So yeah. And then because I lost the place to live, my ex was like, well, since Ange can't go home anymore, I'm going to be the savior and I'm going to pay their rent. So, you know, and stuff like that. So that way they can find another place in the meantime. So then my ex got fucking Aaron Hans and Ego Raptor to like share their commission post, made a shit ton of money off of commissions and then pocketed all the money and decided to not pay to help me out. So yeah, and just bailed on me. And I even like asked them if they could like at least share my commission post and they refused. And then they like went off to like my friends and began spreading the story about me being this terrible, evil person and even contacted like my high school best friends, friends. Like this is how far this person went to smear me. And this person just destroyed my life. I lost my home. I, a home I couldn't go back to. So I was forced to be homeless for three months. I lost money. I lost my job too, because at that point I was now couch surfing and my closest friend lived like over an hour or two away. So I wasn't going to be able to keep the job that I had for very long as a caricature artist. Like this person just showed up and just decimated my life just decimated it. And none of these people, my roommates, this, my ex, nobody felt bad. They didn't acknowledge it. They, it was like terrifying. And then when I was suicidal and unstable over it, they would use that to say that I was just manipulative. And I was just like, I was so confused. I had no idea what had just happened. I was like, what the hell just happened? I feel like I have lost my mind because I don't know what just happened. I thought I was doing everything to comply with these people. And now I'm in this horrible situation. All these people think I'm evil. I haven't done anything to anyone. And even when I try to tell people my side of the story, they would just be like, they just wouldn't really listen because they had already heard my ex's side first. And so this person just ruined my life and took off. And that was horrible. It was just, this was the second time in my adult life that I had my life destroyed. So yeah. And if you're wondering what this has to do with the industry, the person like also would try to like apply for the industry stuff that I was get going for because they wanted to work in the industry too and stuff. So yeah, anyways. So now I was in this situation where I was homeless for certain for three months. I had a home I couldn't go back to. I could not pay my, well, okay, let me back up a bit. I tried to keep my caricature job. And so I would have to drive to the theme park to do it. But because I had to still make money, I still had to pay rent to a place I couldn't go home to. And I remember I had um, been my friend on Rick and Morty was the one who came in and saved me. She brought me to her place and let me sleep on her couch for three months. And I don't know what I would have done without that kindness. And so, <laughs> yeah, like she, she saved me because it was bad. <laughs> and I had to drive like at least an hour at times, two hours because of traffic in LA one way and then back for this job. And so I was just completely fucked up. I was dealing with the fallout of this relationship. I was dealing with losing everything. And I was trying to keep this job. And I just remember driving hours and just sobbing in my car and the traffic. Just my limbs would cramp up so bad. I was in so much pain just because of how 
hard it is to be on the road that much for a job that wasn't even paying very well. And I would, you know, sit in my car, I would self-harm, and then I would wear a sweater and go to work and pretend nothing was wrong. I would throw up in the bathroom and then try to put on a smile and entertain people. It was just so taxing on me to have to, like, pretend to be okay when all of this was happening. And I knew that I wasn't going to be able to keep my job much longer because I couldn't keep driving like that and I couldn't keep working myself like that. At some point, I even got heat stroke because I had to dress in long clothes because... I was self-harming and it was just bad and I finally reached this point where I was like I don't want to do this anymore so I tried to kill myself and that was the first major like suicide attempt of mine and I remember I ended up attempting my life and they, my friend came and got me and made sure the hospital took me in and, well, the hospital took me and they were, the hospital was really condescending and really mean to me too. They treated me like I was just this menace and told me that I chose to do this. So any way they treated me was my fault and I ended up in the psych ward. So, yeah, and so the psych ward was not a good place. Like, I would have thought that they would have helped me or, like, treated me compassionately, but no, they treated me more like I was a prisoner who had just committed a crime. And it was just, it was this very eerie situation. I didn't have access, really, to the outside world. I remember there was nothing to do while I was there except pace these white hallways. I had this one roommate who just never left bed because they were so depressed. So like, I never saw them get out of bed. And there was like this other girl that was there and she was kind of weird because she would like giggle a lot and she would like sit next to me and be like, if you want to get out of here sooner, you got to smile all the time and just act like nothing's wrong. And I was just like, okay and she was also really weird because she was like I was like you know like we were like talking about like why we were in here and she was like oh yeah I cheated on my boyfriend with his friend and I got pregnant and it was so funny and I was just like okay <laughs> okay so like it was definitely like a weird experience because the kinds of people that were there were very interesting I was only there for a couple of days because I hated it so much. I was like, I am going to do everything to look functional so I can get out of here. And they also refused to acknowledge my DID diagnosis because at that point I had been diagnosed. And so they kept insisting that I was bipolar, but I don't fit the criteria for bipolar. I'm not bipolar. Nothing against that. I just, I just don't have it. So they put me on like meds that actually were fucking me up too. And so it was just really bad because yeah and um eventually I got out and I remember the night that I got out of the psych ward I my friend picked me up and I was sitting on her couch and I couldn't pay my bills too because I had missed work so she covered them for me but I sat there and I was like okay I just lost my relationship I lost some of my friends, I lost my life, I lost my home, I am going to lose my job because I can't keep it with the driving and everything going on. I am stuck, I have nowhere to go. What? I am at rock bottom. I have just lost everything and the people who have hurt me will never feel bad, never feel accountability, and they are going to continue to live their lives merrily to this day even having popular community or social media presences and that is just the reality that I had to accept that there was never going to be accountability for what these people did to me and anyways so I was sitting there on my friend's couch and I was just like I have just lost everything what do I do now how do I get out of this this is not looking good and my friend and I had a conversation 
and we remembered our mutual friend who had uh, I we had both in between four back at the college I was at was working on a show and so just the night or like the day after it was very soon after I got out of the psych ward I just shot an email to the show creator and was like hey can I test for your show are you hiring and that was the first time that I got a response and I did get a test and it was really hard to do the test because I was doing it while I was homeless and driving hours and stuff but I did the test and I got freelance from Cartoon Network for it when I was 20 and that was I just remember like when I got that freelance, it was also when I was at the end of my like three months of suffering and I was moving into a new place and it was also through my birthday. So I remember I spent my birthday moving into a new apartment while doing freelance. And it was really hard because having to do a storyboard artist workload while you're moving is just very difficult. So I was like pulling all nighters and stuff just because I was so determined to get the freelance in and I was able to do it. And that was my first gig in the industry. And from there, I remember I ended up leaving my job that was the caricature job and I ended up working at a more local place, which was also horrible by the way once I like got this job the girls that work there all hated me because what happened was apparently the store owner had like hired me and the store owner was like never there and the girl who was kind of like the pseudo manager even though she was like younger than me she was like I think 20 or something but the girl that like worked there apparently like all of the hires were her friends so when she found out that the store owner had hired me and it wasn't one of her friends she did not like me so when I worked there these girls would just constantly like try to sabotage me like they would purposely not teach me things and then when I would mess up they would report it to the store owner to get me chewed out they would steal my tips I was just treated like garbage for no reason and so I had to learn how to like just kind of adapt and work around this really hostile work environment for no reason like, I have no idea why these people were so petty or what their damage was, but they would make fun of me too. They would like take pictures of me and then like Snapchat to each other and like laugh about me and I would just have to brush it off. So it was just really shitty. But thankfully, some months later, when season two of the show that I did freelance for was starting up, they were hiring for a board revisionist and they contacted me and were like, do you want to work full time? And I was like, yes, I do. So I got to go into like that retailish, it's not retail, but the place that I worked and I just got to be like, bye, I'm getting a better job now and I'm going to make more money than all of you. <laughs> so yeah, and that was, that was how I got into the industry. I just finally, something eventually worked out for me and I got to work at Cartoon Network for over a year and it was the best experience of my life. I loved it. I just had so much fun. Everything was great. And I guess you could say, well, that's the end of the story, I guess, if you want to pretend that it ended on a happy note. But obviously, as we know, a year later, I would then fall horribly ill and would lose that all. So yeah, but that's my story. That's what happened to me and still here. <laughs> so yeah. So like I said, I don't really expect many people to watch these videos because they're very long and very rambly, but if you're someone who did watch it and you want to ask any questions, feel free to comment and maybe I'll talk about it in another video. This is just a way for me to pass time right now because 
I am very sad and my life is very awful right now and I need a way to pass time. So yeah. <laughs>